Well, today, I've looked forward uh, to this morning for a long time since we uh, were able to book our speaker. He's one of my uh, absolute favorite speakers in all of the world. We're so blessed to have Louis Giglio with us today. You know, when I think of Louis, uh, listening to him preach and so many what I would call classic sermons, uh, messages for the ages that uh, just as I've listened to them over and over again, they impact my heart and they've increased my love for Jesus. But then when you get to know Louis personally, um, one of the things you walk away from those conversations is you just wanna be like Jesus. Uh, this is a man who loves the Lord with all of his heart. And when you've been with him, it just makes you wanna go be with Jesus because uh, you can tell Louis spent a lot of time with the Lord. I have such high respect for him, not only as a preacher, but just as a man of God. And we are blessed, blessed, blessed to have him at James River Church. So to all of our campuses, would you join me? Come on, let's give Louis Giglio a big James River welcome. Love you so much. Love you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, please uh, be seated. What a privilege to be back at James River. Uh, missed last summer, but uh, was here a few summers ago. And you know, it's interesting when um, you have a special relationship with a church. It's not really so much that you fall in love with a church, because you can't fall in love with a church, even though I love you so much. Like when I got this invitation, I didn't even pray about it. I just said yes. And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. I need to back up and pray about it before saying yes. So if something goes wrong in the message today, it's because I didn't pray about it before I just said yes. But you don't fall in love uh, with churches. You fall in love with people. And I love your pastors, John and Debbie. And I have so much respect for them, and especially for Pastor John. His family is amazing. Uh, his team is amazing. And I just am honored again today to be here and just to be with you, spend time with you, to give thanks to God for the way that you bounded up those stairs. I was like, look at him go. He is back. He is healthy. He's got that vivacious spirit and that the voice is strong and God is with him and nothing makes me happier than to see God uh, blessing you and continuing to give you strength. And so thank you and God bless you and thank you for letting me be here today. I want to preach a message that I preached in this church. In fact, maybe one of my most favorite times preaching this message was in this church. And then God has led me to places all over the world, literally on every continent. He's taken me to preach this message. And, and there are seasons of life where he does that. It's not my message, it's not even my title, but it's a message that God has changed my life with. What I came to share today changed my life. And so eventually it made its way into book form about two months ago. So I've done interviews almost every day for the last two months with people all across America and around the world. And one of the questions that came in one of the interviews was, who did you write this book for? And I hadn't been asked that question. I really hadn't prepped for that question. I really hadn't thought, what will I say if someone says, who did you write this book for? So the answer just kind of blurted out and it sounded a little bit weird, but it was true. They said, who did you write this book? Don't give the enemy a seat at your table. Who'd you write that for? I said, I wrote it for me. Meaning that this message changed my life and continues to every week of my life. This message is still in the mix in my life. So I come today not confident in myself and really not confident in a book. You don't need a book to change your life. We already have a book that changes our lives. I'm holding it in my hand right now. It's penned by the breath of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God and it's available to you and it's available to me. But the message in this book that I wrote is a message that I believe can transform a life. And here's the heart of it all. God wants you to know today that you have the authority to change the way you think. In the battle for your life, the battle for your family, for your sanity, 
for your well-being, for your peace of mind, for your marriage, for your children, your grandchildren, and the generations to come. That battle is going to be won or lost in your mind. That's why this book says, renew your mind. The enemy is targeting your thinking and you are the gardener of your own mind. So what gets planted there and what gets uprooted there, hello, is up to you. And I know it sounds like I shifted gears from being very encouraging to very sort of preaching wise, but the enemy, he's bold and brash. He went into paradise and lied to Eve. He didn't have any circumstantial avenue to create doubt in her mind. It wasn't, oh, you lost your loved one in an accident, so God must not be good. It wasn't like, man, this drought we're going through is horrendous and it's gonna ruin and wreck the agricultural economy. There was no circumstantial avenue. So we just went straight at her confidence in God. And he said, so paradise, right? Except that one thing right there. What'd God say about that? He said, we eat that, we die. Oh, did he really, did he really say that? Huh, I wonder why he said that. Maybe he's not as good as you think he is. Maybe he doesn't love you as much as he wants you to think that he loves you. Maybe there's something about that. If you eat that, you're gonna be even as good as he is or better than he is. And he's trying to keep you down and keep him up. So maybe that's why he told you not to eat that. And immediately he attacked the character and the will and the purposes of God and undermined Eve's confidence in God's heart that he's a good God and that he cares for her and has her best in mind. And once he planted that seed of doubt in her mind, we don't have a timeline. We don't know if it was a day later or a week later or three years later, but eventually just like me and just like you, when that seed got planted and wasn't uprooted by truth, but got to root in to her way of thinking, eventually she acted on that thought. So what that means is you're not harboring any thought today that ultimately you're not going to act on. That is also a lie. Oh, I'm never going to do it. I'm just thinking about it. Oh, I would never act on that. I've just been thinking about that. No, the more you think, the more that root is going to take hold. And ultimately in this season or the next season, you're going to do what you're thinking about because thoughts lead to actions and that's why the enemy knows my goal is to plant lies in your mind and if we were truthful today every single one of us including me in this room has got some kind of lie in our mind right now And Jesus is going to make an incredible invitation today. He is going to say to you and me again today, if you let me, I will lead you to truth. And my truth will set you free. So we're going to believe today for more than a message. We're gonna believe for freedom. And I feel bold because I have a PhD, didn't get into my introduction. (laughs) But it will next time. I have a PhD, are you ready? You're like in, in what? Are you ready? in being human. So when I get to, to the heart of this talk, you're gonna think, how does he know this? Oh, that's right, he has a PhD. 
in being human. And what I've learned being a human being is that the first lie is, this isn't gonna work for you. And some of you are already there. Oh, dude's here, gonna do a talk, gonna talk about how we can change the way we think, gonna talk about people getting set free, but it's not gonna work for me. Some of you have already written yourself off from this message today. And you've already positioned yourself to protect yourself because that's what we're best at. And you're like, I'm not gonna get my hopes up again because this isn't gonna work for me because I've been to these things at church before where I got my hopes up and then I prayed the thing and did the deal and whatever, whatever, and nothing happened and it didn't change. And that's probably what's gonna happen today. And you know what? My mom was a worrier and her mom was a worrier and that's why I'm a worrier. We're just from a worrying family. That's just the way it is. It's in our DNA and it's not gonna change. And I don't know what this guy's gonna say today and I don't know what God's gonna put on the table today, but I know I'm probably going to walk out of here and be a warrior just like I walked in here because that's all I've ever known, all I've ever seen all my life. Our family, we are Olympic medal winning warriors at our house and that's just the way it is. And I'm teaching my kids how to worry. And the enemy's already telling you, you don't like yourself. And what is this guy going to say in 30 minutes is going to change the fact that you haven't liked yourself for the last 30 years. It is a lie. The enemy is already lying to you, telling you that God can't set you free. So you'll enjoy the deal. You'll come to church again. You'll give to the future fund. You'll be a part of James River. I'll see you at the Stronger Men's Conference. But you know that stronghold is not going to get broken. You know that pattern isn't going to change. You know that you're really not going to see a breakthrough of God in your life. And I'm just telling you that is a lie. And there's only two voices. There's Yahweh, and there's the other way. And if you're believing right now that you can't change, guess where that's coming from? So right now, in Jesus' name, we reject the lie. In Jesus' name. And pray by the power, the authority, the blood of the risen Jesus Christ that revelation will happen in this room and that you will see that you can change the way you think. Because nobody else in this room can do it for you. And if I can just say one more thing boldly and then I'll shift into more pastoral tone. You can't blame this on anybody else. God is giving you the authority to change the way you think. And Jesus has done everything possible to help you win the battle of your mind. So, Father, we trust right now that you'll do that. Only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. So this message is predicated around the best-known text in Scripture. The Lord is my shepherd. Say it with me. I, sh I said that part. You say the next part. <laughs> Sorry, I don't have a PhD in crowd control. Um, let's just say the whole first line together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall. Wow. So something went wrong, because there's a lot of want in the house. David tapped into something that I need to tap into. He said, I know who's leading my life. I know who's directing my steps. I know who is walking beside me. I know who is leading me and restoring me. I know who fights for me and defends me. I know who provides for me. I know who anoints me. I know who gives me everything that I need. I know who's following me. I'm not looking over my shoulder to see who's back there and what their agenda is. I know who's back there. Uh, goodness and love's back there. That's who's following me every day of my life. And I know where I'm going. I'm not 
not aimlessly out here cruising through life. I know I'm headed to the house of the Lord and I'm gonna dwell in that house all the days of my life. You know why I know all these things? Because the Lord is my shepherd. And so everybody's got a shepherd. No, no shepherdless people in the house. We were made by God and for God. That means that we were made to be led. And so either Yahweh is leading me, Jesus is leading me, or somebody else is leading me, somebody's opinion, something that happened in the past, uh, someone's approval, or for a lot of us in the place, if we were honest, you would just say, I'll tell you who's leading me. I'm leading me, Louie. I got the... I got the bank account, I make the decisions, I call the shots, I'm in charge, which is fine if you want to be in want. Because that psalm goes something like that. I am my shepherd, I lead my life, I run my show, and therefore check back with me in a little while, and not only will I have a place where my heart isn't satisfied and I'll be in want, I will not have found the green pasture. I will not have found the quiet water. I will have run my life in the ground and probably run the lives of all the people around me in the ground. Because when I'm in charge of my life and you're in charge of your life, it doesn't go as great as when Yahweh is our shepherd. And I love verse five because it's a little bit of a conundrum. He says, after he says, and even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Then he says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And I'm like, wait a minute. If I had written Psalm 23, I would definitely not have written verse 5 in. I would have written verse 5 something like this. And you prepare a table before me in your presence. Forget about the enemies. Wipe out the enemies. <laughs> In fact, I would love a table, if we could, Father, by the window so I can watch you wipe all my enemies out while we're enjoying our meal together. But God's plan and our theology that we're proclaiming today isn't that God wants to hit the eject button and get you out of a broken planet. It's that he wants to come into the broken story and he wants to put his presence inside of us by the power of the Holy Spirit through the person of Jesus Christ and he wants to walk with us through this life so that we have a, a table prepared before us in the middle of the storm, in the middle of the conflict, in the middle of the difficulty, in the middle of the person who's trying to stab us in the back, in the middle of the person who's saying things about us that aren't true, in the middle of the person who's trying to take us out, in the middle of the financial breakdown, in the middle of the family crisis, right in the middle of whatever it is, he says, I, Yahweh, am going to provide a table before you. And it is a table of abundance. We put the table here last time, and I said, I want to do a little different talk. They said, no, get the table back. We want to see the table again. So here's a picture of what that looks like. It's a table that God Almighty, the Alpha and the Omega, God from eternity past to God into eternity future. We're talking about God, people. Is everybody okay so far? Everybody's looking at me like I'm reading the sports scores or something out of the paper. We're talking about Yahweh. Yeah. Amen. He came down in the person of Christ. And then he sat down at a table he prepared for you. Hi. How are you? Are you thirsty? You look really thirsty. It's good to see you, by the way. You're awesome. I'm a living water but I'm going to join you. 
How's life? Love you. Oh no, have, go ahead. And you realize, hey, I've still got pressure. I still have enemies. Not, don't think you're my enemies, but you look a little suspect, but. I, don't, <laughs> I still have the storm. The, the doctor's report was what it was. Our marriage right now, it's not great. My mental situation is like hanging by a thread. But in the middle of all of that that's real, Yahweh just poured a glass of water at a table that he prepared before me. And it is a table of abundance. It is not a table of him going, you know, things have been really difficult this year and just to be on the safe side in an abundance of caution. You all share that. (laughs) No. He's like, if I'm not going to do it because I don't need to, but I could turn this like into 10,000 loaves of bread. I've done it before. So if you... If you think there's not going to be enough, you're not realizing who you're sitting with. I love you, and I created this for you. Dear God in heaven, help us right now. We have turned this into some kind of a, a thing when it was always and will always be about a person. And if, you, if you've missed out on this somehow, it's because of a couple problems. Problem number one, you just didn't know there was a table. Or if you did, you didn't factor in enough time. I think that's a lot of us, you know, we're, we show up and we're like, oh my goodness, I had no idea. I, I, I did not factor this in today. I got a jet. Uh, Can can I borrow your coffee? (laughs) I saw that down there. Can can I get a to-go cup? (laughs) Beautiful, though. In fact, before I go, real quick. Do you you mind? Uh, Okay, cool, awesome. I'm going to put my Bible over here. Um, And I need probably need to put my glasses in here because they're cool Warby Parker. They're not. I got those at the CVS, but that's not the <laughs> message today. Um, um, can I borrow someone's phone? Oh, thank you so much. I'm taking all your stuff. This is like the coolest thing <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. This is so good. Oh, no. That's not my... <laughs> Whew. Breakfast with the king. (laughs) Post. (laughs) Seriously, though, it was amazing. And uh, next time, count me in. And you're awesome. Uh, I got a jet. But you, amazing. Hey, how's it going? You are not going to believe what happened earlier today. Check this out. Look at that. I was... No way. I mean, it was like this big table and so, oh, so incredible. Anyway, about that thing we're working on. Um, hello? So you have to know there's someone waiting for you. And you have to sit down. But the second problem is, is that, I think that's yours. When, when we sit down, it's amazing how fast things can get interrupted. Yeah, yes. right. So true. 
I told this story, and I told it in the book, and the editors were helping me with the book, and they were like, do you really want to put this story in the book? And I was like, I have to put this story in the book. And they were like, well, it kind of makes you sound like a jerk. And I said, I know, so maybe we can just put that at the bottom. I'm really, really trying hard not to be a jerk. <laughs> but I told you this story before. Shelly and I are having a birthday dinner at her favorite restaurant in another country. And we were sitting at a table for four people, but it was just the two of us. And we were in the middle of our meal, and these people got up and left their table. And this young guy turned around and came back. Nice guy. Can we just say that together? Nice guy. No, everyone say it. Nice guy. If, you, if you're hearing this, lovely person. And he says, he, he stops and he turns around and he goes, Louis Giglio? I said, yeah, hi. He goes, no way. What are you doing here? It's like, I don't know having dinner. And he uh, said, I never expected to see you here. I said, I know it's crazy, but we actually do get out occasionally. And um, <laughs> he said, I, I was at a conference a few months ago that you spoke at, and the Lord really touched my life. And I, I didn't think I'd see you here. I just want to say thank you. Well, this is like the crazy part of what we get to be a part of, all of us, is God touching people's lives and their stories. And, and so you just are like, thank you, Lord, for letting me be a part of something significant. I said, thank you so much. Great to see you. Great to meet you. And off he went to catch up with his group. So we went back to our meal. And if maybe three, four minutes later, I see him coming back. And I, I say, oh, he must have left his keys or his wallet or put his sunglasses down or something. But I don't see anything on the table. And he gets back and he says, um, hey, this might sound really weird, but I got outside. And I was telling my friend that... Um, that after that conference, I had this vision that the Lord wanted me to talk to you about something. And I never dreamed of ha having a chance to do that. You look so nice and kind, you're gonna hate this, <laughs> this next part. <laughs> and he said, um, and so I thought, well, my friend said, maybe this is the moment that you know the Holy Spirit wants you to have that conversation. And so about that time, I, I love the way that you're protecting that cherry. <laughs> About that time, he, he grabs the empty seat and goes, so I thought maybe we could just talk right now. <laughs> okay, where are we all here on the spectrum? I just need to know, because I'm either going to take this one way or the other. Anybody feeling like this could go sideways or <laughs> most everybody going, I believe it was the Lord, and I hope that you did invite him to sit down and told your wife we'll have another birthday dinner some other time. And so I thought, what do I do? So I just went to my fail safe and I said, hey man, that would be so incredible, but it's my wife's birthday. That's an out. <laughs> and he goes, am I kidding? A nice guy. But he goes, oh, happy birthday. Anyway, so what I wanted <laughs> to do, and at that point I went, oh, okay, not good. And so I had to say, hey, you know, email my office, reach out, Love to have a conversation, but not tonight. Point isn't about that guy because he's a say it with me. Nice. The point is how fast the enemy can get at your table. In a nanosecond. You can walk out of this gathering in this atmosphere of worship and truth and faith and on the way home today. Bam. And he always comes through the side door. It's very rare that he says, hi, um, he has told you about me. I'm the one, when he said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, he was talking about me. So I'm going to gouge your eyes out <laughs> and ruin everything good in your life. You ready? No. He comes alongside that point in every one of our lives today where we feel we've been wronged, overlooked, mistreated, taken for granted, or where we're confused or afraid. And he comes right through that door and he just puts his hand on our shoulder and says, how's it going, man? Wow. And we go, it's not going good. I know. Your boss, what a piece of work. I don't know, honestly, how you stay there. You know why Frank quit? He's your boss. 
And if I were you, I'd have been out of there like so long ago. I'd have been like, hey, I don't know, two, <laughs> two weeks notice, whatever. I don't care. <laughs> I'm out. My I don't think he's at home. Terrible. Listen. Most people would have been gone a long time ago. Props to you. I don't know how you do it. And before you know it, he's eating your lunch. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. At the table that Yahweh prepared for you. This hit me going through a very challenging season about six years ago. One of those enduring seasons of leadership where you want to quit a couple times. And some things had been said, some things had been done. I'd said some things, some other people had said some things. But we journeyed through and a few months had gone by and on my way home from work one day, I got a call that let me know about something that had happened that day. And this is gonna sound super petty, so I'm just gonna be honest. Yes, I have a PhD <laughs> in being human. Something really small about that big happened that vindicated me. And I was so happy. Has, have you ever had that feeling? Like if, if we just wait this thing out, people are gonna see what's really the deal. And that day, it happened. And you know what I did? I just quietly took that to the Lord in my prayer closet. No, I immediately <laughs> texted a friend who had walked through this thing with me and the text started, maybe you've never sent a text like this, the text started something like, you're not gonna believe what just happened. You are not gonna believe what I just heard. You're not gonna believe blah, 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 blah. And if you give these things time, they usually kinda turn around. And I mean a long text that took me at my age quite a minute to compose and I just hit send like, come on, man, this is our day. And I waited, standing at the top of my driveway, I can take you to the exact spot I just waited. I am not putting the phone down, I'm not waiting for a text to come back later tonight, I'm gonna stand right here until I get a text back, and it's gonna be a big, long text back. Don't send me any emojis, okay? And so, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and finally, a text arrives. It's like a blurb, basically. So I'm thinking, well, on the next text is gonna say what I say in half of my text. I'm sorry, I hit send too soon. Here's the rest of that message. So I wait. There is no more rest of that message. And so I finally read the message that was sent. Nine words. <laughs> Don't give the enemy a seat at your table. Wow. What I was looking for was commiseration. What I got was the truth. Because my friend loved me enough to not give me what I wanted, but to give me what I needed. And in effect, they were saying to me in that text, you are acting like an orphan and you are the son of a king. You are acting like you're down here on the ground looking for a crumb you know how we're all just beggars, one beggar finding a crumb to give another beggar. I don't know whoever put that truth in the Bible. Because I'm pretty sure it just said he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. So he might be saying to you today, get up off the floor looking for the crumbs and see the table. And see that you're the daughter of a king. You're the son of a king. You have Yahweh as a shepherd. He'll protect you and defend you and provide for you and lead you. He will prepare a table before you right in the middle of the fray so that no matter what's going on, you're gonna have what you need, not because of what's on the table, but because of who's at the table. And if you can shift into this reality, you can do something powerful. You can get 
the enemy away from your table. You can't stop him from prowling around. That's what the New Testament says. He prowls looking for someone to devour, but you can stop him from sitting down at your table. Because it's your table. And you can, in the power of Jesus, steward the garden of your mind. And I'll tell you in the most practical way how it happens. You don't get the enemy away from your table by fighting the lie. You get him away from the table by focusing on the truth. It's not gonna happen instantly. I talked to a neuroscientist a few weeks ago. And she said, in 66 days, if you think a true thought, you can create a new neural pathway in your mind. If you think a lie for 66 days, you can also create a neural pathway in your mind. So not in 66 seconds, so that's not what we're going to offer today. Let's all pray a prayer at the end and boom, all of our negative thoughts that have taken up root in our minds for all of our lives are going to all go away. Not in 66 hours, but for 66 days, if you focus on what God says is true about you in any particular area, you literally will create a new highway in your mind. So when God says to daily renew your mind to the truth, he knew what he was talking about. We're not talking about spiritual mumbo jumbo here. We're talking about actually recreating the way the neuron processes of your mind work based on a thought that you commit to for 66 days. So you may have been thinking that you're not good enough for the last six years, but in 66 days, if you put God's truth in your mind about who he says you are, you can create a brand new way of thinking. And you say, well, what would, what would the truth be? Well, The truth would be that Yahweh came down and then Yahweh sat down and he booked a table, paid for the table, provided the table, and joined you at the table because he believes that you are so valuable that he wants to be in a relationship with you. He created you in his image for his glory and he loves you. He pursued you when you didn't even know who he was. He was relentless and he never gave up on you. He actually gave his son in exchange for you. So if you wanna put it down on the bottom shelf, you are worth Jesus to God. So to sit at the table and have the enemy telling you, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not spiritual enough, I didn't come from the right family, I don't have the right background, I'm I'm never gonna make it, God doesn't care about me, people don't care about me, I don't even know if I love me, and bottom line, I'm just not enough. Well, you need a revelation today that you are sitting at the table with Yahweh, and when he is serving you today, he's serving you with scars in his wrists and his feet. And notice when he offers you the basket, the scars in his hands. And if you want, you can listen to the enemy and you can sit there and say, I know, I see the scars and I see the table and I know that you've come down for me to have a relationship with me and open a way for me to know Almighty God. But you know what? I still just can't believe that I'm good enough. But if you choose to lay that down and to embrace truth, you can change the way you think. So weird, I was turning over to John earlier today to read about the Good Shepherd, John 10, 10. And when I did, you can't see this, but in my Bible, which I just got rebound because my other one fell apart completely because I'm so spiritual. (laughs) (laughs) Or because I hold it in my hands almost every day doing things like I'm doing right now and do a lot of things to it. But before we found a guy who was brilliant enough to rebind it and replace the pages that were torn and had holes in them and stuff, 
I thought I just have to get a new one. But I didn't really want to get a new one, but I thought we'll just have to. So my friend, a few months ago, went to the International Space Station on a SpaceX rocket. And he's there right now. And he said, I'll take something small for you, and I'll take it to the station with me, and it'll fly around in space for six months, and then I'll bring it back, and I'll give it back to you. What would you like? And I'm like, oh, man. I said, well, my Bible's falling apart, and I'm getting a new one. So I just tore John 1 out. It was already half coming out. And I said, take this. Because it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. So the truth that you need to change your mind is at the table. So you don't need like a bunch of commentaries and encyclopedias at the table. You got the truth who is the living word of God at the table. And this word became flesh and dwelled among us. And so I said, send this. And then a couple of weeks later, my team said, hey, we found a guy who's going to rebind your Bible. I said, great. So we sent the Bible off and he rebound it. Now I got it back and I'm missing the first page of John. So you can, it goes from Luke to John 2. But in four months, I'm getting John 1 back. And I'm going to scotch tape it in. You say, you should send it back to the guy. No, I'm just going to scotch tape it in. And someone said to me, you'll have a page in your Bible that has been in space. I said, my whole Bible came down from heaven. So what does that mean? That means you got to get it open. You got to get it open. And you got to start locating the truth so that when the lie comes, you say, where did you come from? Did you come from Yahweh or the other way? You'll know right away if that word you're getting matches the character, the heart, the will, the ways, and the word of God. And if it doesn't, you do what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10. You take authority over it and you bind it and you bring it into captivity to the person of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 4. You take every thought captive and make it obedient to him. You say, how do I do that? Um, I'll show you. Can I borrow this? Thank you. Can I write in it? We're under extreme conditions here, so I just need to make sure. It's a prop. We said it here beforehand. Because we're smarter than you think we are. Okay, so what's the lie? We're done. We're closing. I'm finished. What, what's the lie? Oh, I know one. Someone, if this is yours, could you just raise your hand? Just raise it high when I write it. Because I want to encourage you to write the lie in your journal. I'm not... I don't know how you write with this pen. <laughs> Hold it straight up and down. My wife tells me that all the time. I'm like, just get a different pen. I'm not going to make it. Anybody? Show of hands. That's your lie right now. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm not going to make it. Not going to make it through what? Oh, just ask them. They'll tell you. Through this diagnosis, through this relational conflict, through uh, the situation in our business, I'm not going to make it. And I'm not saying this about any of these people, but the way you'll know the enemy told them that is because it doesn't match the character, the heart, the ways, and the will, and the word of God. Because that shepherd sitting there said, we're going to go through the valley of the shadow of death. Not to the valley. We're going to go through the valley. So write it down. I'm ta- we're getting tactile. Write it down. I'm not going to make it. 
I told my friend that at coffee yesterday. They said, how you doing? I said, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure I'm going to make it. Where did you hear that? Yahweh told you that? Other way told me that. And when he told you that, he lied to you. He lied to you. Just like the last time he told you that. And if he hadn't lied to you every time, he couldn't even be telling you that right now. So what's the truth? Well, you can pick any number of truths. You can take God's word from so many different verses. But if you combine them all, I would write above the lie, God has brought me through. Every situation and every season. He brought me through the debilitating illness that ended up taking both my parents' lives. Oh, I had not uh, scot-free. I got scars all over. He brought me through a pit of depression I was in for months, a decade ago that I thought I'd never see the light of day. Oh, I still feel it. I still got, I got scars. My wife's father's in seven years plus of cancer treatment right now. Our family has been through every hardship, every kind of difficulty, up against every kind of opposition. We got scars all over the place. But God has brought us through every situation and every season. I'd like to see a show of hands if God has brought you through every situation you've ever been through. Can I see a show of hands? Just hold them as high as you can. 100%. Anybody got any scars? But God brought you through. So I just wrote above, I'm not going to make it. God has brought me through every situation and every season, and I'm now going to cross out the lie. And I'm going to make my new narrative the truth. Because you don't win the battle of your mind by fighting the lie. You win the battle of your mind by focusing on the truth. And so now if we have coffee, I'm not going to sit down and go, uh, when you say, how are you doing? I'm not going to go, oh, I'm just doing wonderful. We got a diagnosis that wasn't what we were expecting. The doctor's report was opposite of what we've been praying. Uh, My husband just lost his job, but praise God, we're blessed and highly favored. (laughs) No, I'm going to say, whoa, man, it is hard right now. But I want to make sure you hear me say, (laughs) this is what we're holding on to. God has brought me through every situation and every season and I believe he's going to bring us through this and when I focus on that truth I change the way that I think I am uprooting you're not going to make it and I am planting God is faithful And if I focus on God being faithful every day for 66 days, I get a brand new highway of the faithfulness of God literally created inside of my mind. And now the normal thought of my mind is, I'm going to make it. I am going to make it. God is going to bring us through. It might not be today. It might not happen tomorrow. It might be in heaven. But if it is heaven, he's going to bring us through because he's always brought us through and he's never going to let us down right now. I am going to change.
change the way that I think. And this is the power of the gospel. And why is the table here? So that as I'm saying, hey, I know it's hard, and yes, my wife's in treatment, or yes, my kid is out in left field, and I don't know when they're coming back, I'm still gonna confess God has brought me through every situation and every season. And when you do that, people at work, your neighbors, your family, they're gonna look at you and go, what is happening to you? How are you so confident in a situation like this? How do you do this? What is going on? And eventually, they're gonna stop looking at you, and they're gonna start looking at who you're looking at. And they're gonna wanna know who's at the table with you. The table is in the presence of the enemies so that our enemies can see us being satisfied by Jesus no matter what. And we get good and he gets glory. And ultimately, that's what it's all about. And that's why he didn't put the table in his presence. He put it right in the middle of the storm so that people ultimately could see him and say, I want whoever is sitting at your table. Jesus, thank you. Lord, thank you that every one of us can look at our scars. Some of them are literal scars. And they're telling a story today of your faithfulness to bring us through. God, I pray that you would speak over your children today, over all of us. You are not an orphan. You are not abandoned. Write it down if you think that you are. I am abandoned. Write it down then. And then draw a line and above it, write what's true. Jesus came from heaven to earth for me. God sets the lonely in families. Even if my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. I now am a child of God. The Lord will ever, never leave me or forsake me. So I'm going to strike through I'm abandoned. Even though somebody did walk out on me, God walked in on me. Even though somebody else left my table, God continues every day to prepare a table. I pray, God, that you would turn stories around today. And I pray that you would give us the grace to take hold of truth, the truth that sets us free. So if that's you today and there is a specific lie that God just put a laser beam on today and you want to call it out right now in Jesus' name, you just want to call it what it is. That's a lie. It's not from Yahweh. It's from the one who's the father of lies, been lying from the beginning. There's no truth in him. And I decide right here and right now I'm taking my table back and I'm setting my eyes on my shepherd and his word and his truth starting here and now. Could you just lift your hand if you've gotten a specific moment like that in this last few minutes together? Lord, again, we know there's no quick fixes, but I do thank you that you touch stories. And maybe one message can't change everything in an instant, but I believe that one instant can change everything. And so I pray the power in the name of Jesus over people today as they're beginning to zero in on what you're saying, to lock eyes with you. I pray that your truth would come like a waterfall and wash them and make them new. And we thank you for that power. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's give God some praise today. Let's give him a shout of praise today. Oh, come on, church. Let's give him the praise he deserves. 
Today, I really want to encourage you right now to order New Normal on Amazon or wherever books are sold. You can pick up one for yourself, a friend, or a family member because God wants you to live in a land that's full of His promise and possibility. And we believe this book will help you on your journey to a new normal. We also have an amazing study guide available on Amazon so you can go through the book with a small group, your spouse, or even friends at a coffee shop so you can get the most out of this amazing resource. As you go throughout your day, this is our prayer for you. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May he smile on you and be gracious to you. May he show you his favor and give you his peace. God bless.